colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the first joint webinar by IETA and Article 6 Implementation Partnership, A6IP, the state of Article 6 implementation after COP28, what opportunities exist for the private sector. My name is Hayato Nakamura, a team member of the A6IP Center. It is my great pleasure to be today's MC. The A6IP Center with IGES, IGES, as a secretariat aims to promote the early and steady establishment of high integrity carbon markets based upon uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which stipulates the use of market mechanisms for tackling the climate change agenda. To fully harness the potential of Article 6 in the international carbon markets, the role of the private sector will be essential. By partnering with IETA as the leading business voice on ambitious market-based climate solutions across the world, the A6IP Center aims to scale up its efforts towards reliable, international, high-integrity carbon markets. In such context, when the A6IP has been launched, IETA joined as one of the partners. Then, to share the information on Article 6 widely, a joint webinar of today is organized. Let me explain today's program. After the opening remarks and taking a, a bit of poll, we have a lecture session by SXIP and IETA to share updates and trends. And then uh, we will have a panel discussion together with the representatives from the private sector and SXIP director. The Q&A session is prepared also following the round of panel remarks. We hope that we can conclude on time in one hour and 45 minutes. I also have a housekeeping announcement. For the questions to the lecturers and panelists, we will use the Q&A window in the Zoom platform. In case you, if you find similar questions or comments, you may click like, like this. Um, and the question that gathers more likes um, will be uh, prioritized in case there is a, a time constraint. So uh, your kind cooperation is uh, really, really appreciated. Besides, I would like to note that the session of today is recorded and uploaded to the web page of ASICS-IP later on. The presentation materials that are to be used today are already available online. The link is posted in the chat box. Without further ado, now, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Kazuko Akutsu, director of the ASICS-IP Center, and Mr. Andrea Bonzani, International Policy Director of IETA for their opening remarks. First, Director Kazu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nakamura-san. And uh, uh, first of all, Happy New Year to all. Uh, and a warm welcome to today's uh, joint webinar uh, together with IETA and the Article 6 Implementation Partnership on the uh, state of Article 6 implementation after COP28 and what opportunities exist for the private sector. So uh, just before going to uh, details, I just wanted to uh, briefly uh, share that this uh, Article 6 Implementation Partnership has been launched in COP27 in Sham Sheikh uh, with the aim to uh, support implementation of Article 6. And now we have uh, uh, 75 countries and more than 100 institutions, uh, including UN institutions, many multilateral uh, banks, uh, and also specialized uh, research institutions and also private sector. Uh, all of them wanted to see how Article 6 could be implemented in a way to benefit for our climate towards net zero uh, and also for our decarbonization of the uh, society. So uh, for this, uh, we have uh, also established a center last year 
uh, which also enables us to uh, really make our activities to be uh, more uh, extended. Uh, and they're really happy to work together with AITA uh, to organize events uh, such as this uh, webinar uh, to really engage private sector uh, for their uh, interest and also for informing what's happening in the policy area such as UNFCCC negotiations. At the same time, we also like to see how we can support for the implementation of the private sector's engagement uh, in the carbon market. So. Uh, for this uh, today's seminar, uh, we hope to uh, share what has been discussed in the COP28, uh, particularly on Article 6, uh, and we have a, a more detailed presentations, uh, which uh, we hope to share with you that uh, we had a very uh, good discussion, uh, also several, several areas which uh, seems to have a good uh, progress, uh, and I think uh, this seminar could be opportunity to understand what has been discussed. At the same time, uh, today, uh, AITA has also shared uh, uh, many also exciting and uh, uh, events happened in the COP28. And also there are many uh, activities and progress uh, that has been seen in the implementation Article 6 and also carbon market. So uh, for this, uh, we'd like to uh, also reflect with our uh, distinguished panelists here today to think about what opportunities, uh, how we can harness and then what could be the issue that could be overcome together. So uh, I, uh, we hope that uh, this seminar will really pave our way. And I'm sure everybody is also uh, preparing for this year's activity. And uh, maybe we can also uh, reflect uh, today's discussion into each uh, everybody's activities for this year. Uh, so the objectives really wanted to uh, share uh, and then move forward uh, together. So uh, with that, I'd like to warmly welcome all of you and looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Kazu. Then and, uh, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Director Andrea of IGETA. Thank you, Nakamura-san. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to IGETA to partner with uh, Japan and the Article 6 Implementation Partnership. At AITA, we have been advocates of uh, international carbon market mechanisms and uh, Article 6 for, for many, many years. Uh, we're just uh, coming out of a year uh, that was challenging. Uh, 2023 was uh, a year in which carbon markets were on the news uh, very often for the wrong reasons. Some of the criticisms made were, were justified. Others were a bit superficial and perhaps ideological. And then uh, at the end of the year, we had uh, a debacle at COP28 uh, with the lack of agreement in, in Dubai. So against this very challenging backdrop, uh, we were still amazed and surprised to see the resilience of, of markets and the resilience of the work on Article 6 implementation. Uh, we've had the first uh, authorizations being, uh, being issued uh, by governments and in the voluntary markets, in spite of uh, all the negative press, the level of retirements at the end of the year was quite high. Um, the figures are still being finalized. We don't know whether it was a record year or uh, a near record year, but still uh, uh, there has been uh, a lot of activity in, in the market. And uh, when it comes to the Article 6 uh, process, uh, what we see is that uh, much of what was being done can continue uh, in spite of the lack of consensus at COP28. Uh, even the delay in the Article 6.4 mechanisms uh, can be relatively small if uh, the supervisory body continue, continue its work, uh, starting from the first meeting at the end of next month. And, and on 6.2, uh, countries have what they need uh, to develop their frameworks to, to authorize uh, units and, and uh, uh, finalize transactions. Uh, uh, what we really need, the negotiations are still important, but what is crucial now is action at the national level, policy developments, uh, protocols, processes, so that AITA members and all, all uh, private sector companies that are looking at Article 6 as an effective tool uh, to reduce emissions and invest in in uh, mitigation projects, uh, well, they 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 need from governments uh, 
uh, what what uh, what is required to to move ahead. Uh, so uh, this is where uh, initiatives like the Article Six Implementation Partnership become very important uh, to raise awareness, build capacity uh, around the world. And at AITA, uh, we do uh, our part as well with the private sector. Uh, we keep advocating uh, for carbon markets uh, worldwide, as we've done for many years. And also we have a special initiative called uh, Business Partnership for Market Implementation. And this is uh, uh, a program that uh, aims at building the capacity of the private sector in countries that want to make use of carbon markets. Uh, last year, we engaged in, in Brazil, Indonesia, and in the West Africa region. And uh, in 2024, we want to continue engagements in these countries and regions, but also add new ones. We want to expand our work in Africa to, to East Africa, and uh, our, we want to expand our work in Asia to, to Vietnam and potentially other countries in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so we hope that uh, that would be a good source of synergies with uh, the Article 6 implementation partnerships. And uh, this webinar would be the first step of, uh, of a fruitful collaboration with real impact on the ground. So thank you very much and look forward to the rest of the event. Thank you very much for your kind remarks. Uh, before moving to the lecture section, uh, we would like to take a brief and easy poll through this Zoom platform so that everyone here can understand who is connected with this webinar. There are the two questions and I'm grateful that if you can kindly answer them from the pop-up box of the Zoom platform. The first question is, what industry are you in? Kindly scroll, scroll down to see various options. Then in case if you are working under dual, dual duties or intersector the industry, it will be grateful to choose one that can mostly fit your situation. The second question, how far are you familiar with Article 6 of the Paris Agreement? Kindly evaluate your knowledge level by yourself. One, from the least knowledge, while four, very familiar with your Article 6. So I hope that uh, many of you already click and uh, answered in some extent. Okay, so that can we see the results? Uh, for the first one, we found like uh, there are so many scientific research and professional and technical services, but. Uh, but also there's a variety of people like uh, government or others or education so that there's a uh, uh, many peoples and the varieties of the sector except the construction. I, I don't see anybody from the construction section. And uh, familiarity, we found that there's uh, many, uh, uh, in some extent, so the, uh, uh, there are many peoples uh, have knowledge, particularly like a three or four, while there's also the people who have the uh, little knowledge about uh, uh, Article 6. So that uh, I understand that IETA and also HXIP Center together with IGES so that we can also uh, introduce various webinars so far. But, but anyway, so that uh, having in mind so that uh, we can start the session. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation. So that with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to the first presenter today, my colleague, Mr. Spanat Shotevitaya Taragun, uh, program manager of the A6IP Center. He just joined the center this month. While during the COP28, he participated in Article 6 negotiation as one of the Thai delegates, a legal, as a legal specialist from the Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization, TGO. A reminder for the audience, by the way, if you have questions about the presentation, kindly uh, write in the Q&A box and you can, uh, they can be answered all together after the panel discussion from the questions which gather the most likes. 
So, uh, Mr. Spanat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nakamula-san, for the kind introduction. And very nice to, to also see online participants from various sectors joining us today. And it's good to know that um, many also have quite, um, has been quite familiar with Article 6 already, while some um, are also starting to, to engage um, in, in this area. So um, in this session, in this first um, session, I will briefly share the A6IP reflection on the Article 6 negotiation at COP28, the key issues discussed and, and the direction we, we see going forward, as well as how we see the role of private sector in, in this process. So um, starting off with the, so please go to the next slide, please. So starting off with the key messages. So one of the, the key focuses at COP28 was um, undeniably the, the outcome of the first global stock take. So it's important to, to firstly highlight that the decision from COP28 on the global stock take also have a reference to Article 6. And this emphasizes the recognition of the positive role of market and non-market based cooperation in accelerating implementations towards the goal of the Paris Agreement. A second key message is, is um, also that while there is unfortunately no decision on Article 6.2 and 6.4 at COP28, countries are already cooperating, particularly on a bilateral basis. And we see many important implementation milestones last year, including that there are already four countries having submitting the initial reports. And as well as the first international transfer being executed and announced earlier this year. So it's important to note that countries are continuing and they can continue to cooperate and laying foundation in preparation for the Article 6 in implementation um, in spite of no decision in Dubai. And also this link with the third important key message is that there has been a lot of attention um, last year given to integrity and transparency of carbon markets. This leading up to COP28 and also become the focus of the discussion there as well. So with the why there's no decision at this COP, having a bottom up examples of implementation on the ground can show how implementation can be done. And by implementing with high integrity, they can also generate trust and confidence uh, for right with the various stakeholders in this process. So these are the key um, messages that, that we would like to convey. So uh, to next slide, please. So now when it comes to where we are in terms of the process and operationalization of Article 6. So this slide shows the progress that we have made so far. And it shows that while there are um, no further guidance um, from this time, there are already a foundation and loop book for Article 6 in place. And a lot of progress has been made since COP26, including a number of guidance and loops uh, that can be applied for implementation. So at the same time, noting that um, the mandates from Sham will be carried over to uh, Baku uh, this year for countries to continue discussions on any further necessary guidance that is needed. So uh, just to give you a clear picture is that there's already uh, a lot of work has, has been done and a foundation that uh, we help countries to implement Article 6. So to the next slide, please. So um, to take a bit closer look into the substance of discussions and firstly, uh, the reflections on Article 6.2 discussion at COP28. So on Article 6.2, uh, as Kasu-san mentioned, there are constructive discussions during um, COP28 on various issues. And um, here we try to, to summarize the discussion in a simplified manner, so we hope, and um, hope that it, it can give you a, a brief um, overview on how the negotiation revolves around those issues. So essentially, uh, as you can see here, there are different perspective, perspectives uh, from groups of countries on what was needed for the effective operationalization of Article 6.2. And we can see here from, from two sides, so um, there's uh, countries and, and group of countries who view that implementation can be um, start right now based on the equity decisions. And also that it's important not to delay uh, reporting obligation uh, in order to ensure transparency and that a lot of work, especially the technical work, uh, can be done by, by the secretariat. 
But there's also um, countries that have um, uh, um, perspectives that clear rules require, are required for market integrity and that the robust reporting and review are necessary for trust and transparency. So uh, we, we see countries having different, different perspectives on how the operationalization of Article 6 by 2 should look like. However, uh, we can also see that there are common, commonalities when it comes to emphasizing the importance of transparency and ensuring the effective operate, uh, functioning of international carbon markets. So um, through the negotiations, what we also want to highlight here is that there are issues which have a good level of maturity and has been progressed quite substantially at COP28 and have received uh, broad acceptance. And, and this include issues just as um, in terms of the authorization, the, the process, um, that it can either be a single process or a, a subsequent process. And also on the elements of authorization that can be provided on a voluntary basis. There are also issues that has been discussed regarding the change to authorization. And there seems to be a general um, convergence that changes to authorization should not affect the mitigation outcomes that has already been first transferred. And this will also be an issue that gives confidence to the private sector and give certainty for their engagement in the common market. There are also other um, technical issues leading to, to um, providing transparency and, and reporting sequences that has also been discussed um, quite to some extent and, and been given uh, quite some broad acceptance. However, there are also still some divergences views on contentious issues, including uh, definition of corporate approaches, whether it's necessary and to, to what extent should that be defined, and also some other um, more technical issues as well. So these issues will need to be resolved before there can be a, a decision at the next COP. So what's um, currently going to take place is that countries are, will continue to, to discuss and essentially officially at the next subsidiary body meeting uh, in the middle of this year to continue the conversation and hopefully that this issue can be resolved um, later this year in Baku. So to next slide, please. So now when it comes to um, Article 6.4, what we want to point out is that a lot of substantive progress has been made um, last year, including the work by the supervisory body, which include um, the adoption of several standards and procedures, including on activity standards, um, activity cycle, validation and verification, accreditation, as well as on the matters relating to the transition of civilian activities. There are also two key um, recommendations from the supervisory body, one on the methodological uh, requirements and another one on the activities involving removals. And there's also progress has been made on the development of the SDGs, the two for sustainable development, the appeals and grievance procedures and, and many others that has been done. So um, that's a lot of progress um, last year by the supervisory body itself. Also at the country level, we see more than 60 countries having designated the uh, national authority for Article 6.4. So this reflects uh, the intention for many countries to utilize Article 6.4 to support implementation of their NDCs. At the same time last year, the Secretary has received over 1,330 requests for transition of student project uh, activities which could potentially be a strong base to kickstart Article 6.4 um, once up and running. And, and we see um, the global, stock uh, global stakeholder consultation that has been launched um, launched by the secretary earlier this month while, while noting that the host country will also need to consider whether to approve these transitions by the end of 2025 next year. So um, next slide, please. So the key discussion under Article 6.4 also revolves around two important recommendations that was um, uh, explained earlier. So the one is on the requirements for developing and assessing the 6.4 methodologies, and another on the requirements for activities involving removals. And why there are both acceptance on the methodological requirements, um, recognizing that further work is to be done, there are contentious issues um, remaining on the requirements for activities involving uh, removals, and this include issues relating to the application to it, um, projects and activities, as well as on the management of reversal risk, in particular on the long-term reversal, and potentially the role of host party and any other participating parties in this process as well. So this will uh, be something that the SB will continue its works, 
and also other um, necessary work that is needed to be done in order to prepare for a comprehensive uh, implementation package, as well as to uh, recommend further recommendations that is needed for adoption at the next uh, COP in Baku. So uh, next slide, please. So also um, moving on to the CDM. So for CDM, fortunately, we have a decision by CIMP uh, CIM 18 on CDM guidance, which includes setting up a process to address uh, non-responsiveness of CDM uh, DNAs, which has become a problem for some countries, and also laying the groundwork for the continuation discussion on two key topics. So the first one is on the functioning of the CDM. And uh, in this year, the Secretary has um, done a technical paper, which uh, the CMP uh, take notes of, which um, proposed a deadline for requesting issuance of pre-2023 um, by the end of 2025 while uh, recognizing that the decision will need to be made in Baku on the functioning and operation of um, various processes and institutions, uh, including the appropriate um, timeline for this purpose. Uh, another key importance is on the authorizing the transfer of remaining funds in the CM Trust Fund to the Adaptation Fund and potentially uh, other areas of funding and, and the amount that, does need, uh, that will be transferred uh, and also the technical work will, will be done by the secretary to provide um, information uh, for consideration on this topic. So um, I'm going now to the last slide. So uh, in terms of the way forward and how we see the important role uh, of the private sector in this process. So firstly, as reflected at the beginning of the presentation, it will be helpful to showcase practical examples on the cloud and as from last year, uh, many countries are already preparing and moving to a six implementation. So the private sector can play a crucial role in initiating pipelines of Article 6 activities and ideas. And this helped demonstrate the potential opportunities for Article 6 around the world and to accelerate implementation on the ground. Secondly, as countries are starting to set up their own arrangements, which are, uh, are potentially based on national context, and can be different from countries to countries. Important that project developers can navigate to these different um, arrangements and rules applied by each country and as well as bilateral cooperation. So information sharing will be uh, very helpful and will be key to promote accessibility and clarity for stakeholders. And this is something that we can cooperate with A6IP together with AIDA and partners to support on this matter as well. And lastly, we would like to also stress the importance of contribution from the, from the private sector in the engagement in rulemaking and implementation process, including on 654. And we take note that the Article 654 supervisory body uh, will also be reaching out to private sector in their processes. And the private sector can provide helpful inputs and provide practical and robust Article 6 implementation going forward. So um, I will stop here and with this, I very much thank you for your attention and I give the floor back to Nakam Blatan. Thank you um, very much for your kind presentation. Then I would like to pass to the next presenters. Uh, Mr. Bion Fonden, International Policy Advisor of IETA and the Director Andrea uh, IETA. Both of them joined COP28 and closely monitored the Article 6 negotiation, as well as various events held during the COP28. And personally, as a non participant for COP28, I enjoyed their posts on LinkedIn or other platforms during the conference. So I would like to request the IETA team to present the opportunities and trends for 2024. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nakamura san. Uh... Happy New Year and uh, good evening to everyone from, from Singapore. As mentioned, uh, I'm the International Policy Advisor at uh, IETA in Singapore and focus largely on the international developments under Article 6, as well as the regional markets growth here in Asia and the Pacific. And uh, we want to now move into focusing really on the trends and opportunities for the private sector when it comes to Article 6. So if we can uh, get the slides uh, on screen, thank you. Uh, we can move to the uh, next one. I think uh, Supernoot provided a great overview of the negotiations uh, from COP28, so I won't delve much upon that. But as we know, it was the largest COP ever, 
and it's probably also had the highest number of announcements and no negotiated outcomes ever. So although there was a failure to reach agreement on Article 6 in the formal negotiations, implementation is moving ahead. And uh, if we go to the next slide, that's really what we want to focus on here today. The opportunities that exist for the private sector, as well as identify some of the barriers or bottlenecks in terms of implementing projects on the ground that are keeping us from fulfilling the full ambition of Article 6. Now at COP28, we already saw more than nine bilateral agreements and MOUs being signed between Morocco and Norway, Rwanda and Kuwait, as well as Singapore, with Fiji, Senegal, Costa Rica and Singapore, as well as Chile and Tunisia with Switzerland. We saw an implementation agreement between PNG and Singapore, which uh, will allow for international carbon credits to be used to meet uh, carbon tax obligations here in Singapore. And finally, uh, Sweden and Switzerland cooperating on negative emission of technologies or removals on top of Sweden's contributions to the Asian Development Bank uh, Climate Action Catalyst Fund, which aims to mobilize innovative upfront carbon finance to scale carbon projects and transaction of internationally transferred mitigation outcomes at most, as well as their initiative of uh, $28 uh, million with UNDP to raise ambition through Article 6 in Africa, uh, the CARTA project, which aims to re both reduce emissions and contribute to poverty alleviation in that region. Now, in addition to all the Article 6 agreements, as Andrea mentioned importantly, we also saw a lot of movement on national and regional frameworks. As we can see from the work we are doing with, with governments and member companies across the world, we need to see progress on national frameworks to also move forward with the international transactions. So notably, we saw Rwanda launching a new carbon market framework. We saw Vietnam outlining their plans for a compliance market fully coming online in the second half of this decade, in addition to the Article 6 agreements the country has already reached. We saw Turkey uh, planning to launch their ETS in 2025. Nigeria appointing a special committee to draft a national carbon market strategy. We saw the economic community of West African states, uh, ECOWAS, announcing new initiatives to standardize carbon certification and trading practices in the region. And finally, UAE developing a domestic carbon registry to support the development of both compliance and voluntary carbon markets in the future. With carbon pricing around the world now covering more than 23% global GHG emissions. And although prices are generally still low, we are seeing an increase, which will also help to drive climate ambition in the next LDC implementation cycle uh, beyond 2025, together, of course, with developments in uh, the voluntary carbon markets. And for that, uh, I would like to hand back to Andrea uh, for the updates from COP28. Yes, and we can move thanks, thanks Bjorn. Uh, in the next slide, we summarize the uh, many announcements and non-negotiated outcomes around uh, voluntary carbon markets. Uh, what we've seen was uh, unprecedented cooperation between uh, different standards, uh, carbon crediting uh, mechanisms, and, and other uh, corporate initiatives uh, focusing on decarbonization and uh, voluntary carbon markets. Uh, there was a joint statement uh, by uh, several independent crediting programs uh, that was facilitated by the UAE presidency as well as AITA, and uh, there would be a, a work program uh, for the year. Um, and uh, this is a sign of uh, the fact that standards are taking uh, the quality of carbon credits and the integrity of the market very, very seriously. Um, we've had the uh, ICBCM process in uh, ongoing for uh, a few years now. Uh, we will have um, credits labeled uh, uh, with the uh, as core carbon principle compliant uh, in 2024, uh, and uh, we really see uh, these as crucial steps for the market to to mature and uh, to. Uh, 
provide the credibility that it needs uh, to scale and uh, to, to be used also for compliance purposes under Article 6.2. Uh, another initiative to, um, uh, to highlight is uh, the launch of the Cut Trust uh, Data Dashboard uh, on December 15th, uh, on the last days of COP. Uh, it feature four independent registries, including the largest one uh, run by Vera, as well as the first national registry uh, from uh, Bhutan. Uh, Cut Trust is uh, an initiative um, uh, led by AITA, the government of Singapore and the World Bank, and it aims at uh, 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 providing access to data from uh, the various uh, independent and national carbon crediting programs to uh, avoid double counting and, and increase mar market integrity. Uh, other uh, developments to uh, take note of was uh, the launch of uh, the uh, claims code of practice by VCMI. Uh, this will uh, provide guidance uh, for the use of, uh, of carbon credits by, by corporates. Um, then there has been work on, on new methodologies and, and uh, crediting mechanisms uh, to know the launch of a new consolidated Red Plus methodology by, by Vera and uh, progress uh, on the energy transition accelerator uh, launched by the US State Department. This will generate a jurisdictional scale credits from the energy sector. Uh, and um, Chile, the Dominican Republic and Nigeria are expected to be uh, the first uh, pilot countries. Um, something uh, targeting the energy sector is uh, being launched by uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. This is the attraction uh, scheme. Um, so it's aimed at uh, early retirement of coal plants throughout Asia uh, through the generation of high integrity and jurisdictional scale carbon credits. Um, so these are all notable developments. And um, we, We've always supported uh, progress in the voluntary carbon market, but uh, with the current background of uh, lack of decisions at COP28 and uh, as lower than expected operationalization of the 6.4 mechanism, uh, the, the, the role of independent uh, accrediting programs uh, becomes crucial because uh, they are uh, if not the only, uh, the very few uh, active crediting mechanisms that can generate credits that then uh, countries can authorize uh, for uh, uh, under Article 6 for compliance towards NDCs or uh, for uh, other compliance purposes, such as the Corsia scheme for, for international aviation. Uh, in the next slide, we summarize um, the state of play in relation to, to Article 6. On our website, we track government to government agreements uh, between potential buyers and sellers under Article 6. Uh, and uh, some of these agreements uh, plan to rely on independent crediting schemes now used in the voluntary markets. And, and Singapore is a, is a good example uh, of this with uh, agreements uh, so far with four. Uh, independent uh, credit mechanisms. Uh, so based on, on the feedback we regularly get from our members, we, we, we expect uh, for authorized credits to, uh, to, to scale and, 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 and uh, remain robust throughout 2024. Uh, and the expectation is that uh, countries will move forward with the authorization frameworks and protocols uh, will provide further clarity on uh, the intention to use on uh, Article Six and 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 the modalities uh, and uh, the work on implementing uh, the Article Six mechanism will continue. Uh, in spite of the delay, uh, there is a, a war program uh, for 2024. Uh, so that's a process we will continue to watch and and support. Um, we believe this is a crucial piece of of uh, international carbon markets uh, going forward. So uh, I'd like to stop here, uh, hand over to Nakamura-san. Uh, happy to answer questions now or, or later. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. Now to brainstorm about the opportunities to come and to share the idea for the next step 
particularly in terms of the collective or partnered action. We prepared a panel by having a distinguished panel moderator and distinguished panelists from the private sector. Mr. Takashi Hongo from Mitsui has kindly agreed to moderate the session. Then three panelists who work for on climate change issues in the private sector, namely Mr. Edwin Arders, uh, senior uh, principal uh, scientist, low carbon technology, DMV. Ms. Uh, Stephanie Russell, uh, executive director, pollination. And Ms. Uh, Florence Rado, uh, global uh, senior director on climate policy, conservation international. Also, our HXIP director, Mr. Uh, Kazuhisa Kawakutsu will join the panel as one of the uh, one uh, who participated in Article 6 negotiation during the COP28. So I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Hongo. Yes, thank you very much. So the, uh, I'm Takashi Hongo. I work for Mitsui Global Static Studies Institute, as well as the board member of the International Emission Trading Association and the co-chair of uh, Japan Working Group. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and arranging uh, this kind of very, very interesting webinar. Thank you very much. So as the secretary explained, the, we invited the uh, four distinguished uh, the panelists. All of them has a rich experience in a market. So that I, uh, we would like to discuss about what happened now after COP28 and what would be the next step to its scale up the carbon market. So, the, but the, oh, a little bit early to see, could you uh, off this, oh, yes, thank you. And the, uh, so this session, and the, we would like to focus on uh, Article 6. So the, uh, as uh, Andrea Ayeta explained, there are uh, many uh, new uh, initiatives and uh, also big progress about the voluntary government as well. But uh, the following the agenda, uh, uh, firstly, we would like to focus on uh, Article 6 and uh, how to uh, use Article 6 for climate change action. And we understand uh, Article 6 is a useful instrument to push the climate change action forward. So the, uh, uh, we would like to have a two part of uh, the panel discussion. First part is a uh, risk and opportunity after COP28. So the, uh, already the uh, uh, Ayata and uh, Idris uh, <laughs> explained and uh, what happened. And we understand that there is uh, big progress. However, the uh, Article 6 itself, we don't have no agreement. So there, we have to think about the opportunity and risk uh, both we need to think about. That will be the first part. And uh, after that, we are discussing about uh, how to scale up the uh, Article 6 market and also uh, now we are facing a kind of the bottleneck is no agreement. And the, so the, how we, AS, uh, A6IP and IETA should have a uh, collaborate to push the uh, uh, use of the Article 6 market for climate change. So these the two parts are there. So the, uh, we would like to move on to the uh, first part. So first part, uh, that is as a mention, it's an opportunity and risk. So the, uh, I would like to invite four uh, panelists and the, uh, I would like to ask all of you to introduce yourself first. But the important thing is what is your involvement? What is the role at the carbon market? After that, uh, could you explain your view, opportunity and risk? Also, particularly the, uh, after the no agreement at the COP28, uh, please uh, show your view on uh, barrier uh, and risk. Uh, don't forget about the barrier and risk, please. So the, uh, at the first uh, part, I would like to ask first Kazu and next Edwin, uh, Stephanie, and Flores. 
this order, I would like to ask you to show your view, please. So first, Kazu, please. Thank you. Thank you, Hongo-san, for your introduction of the discussion. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the views from panelists. And uh, uh, I myself representing from the Article 16 partnership. And uh, I think Spanet has uh, already expressed uh, our assessment, which is, I think, uh, 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 even uh, without the agreement on 6.2 and 6.4, already we have a set of rules that has been agreed from Glasgow as well as detailed guidance have been already agreed, delivered from Shamshek, which already enables us to implement Article 6. So although more clarity may help us, uh, but I think uh, even with the current set of all the rules, it already enables us to move forward, which already uh, many uh, bilateral engagement and also uh, 6.4 and even the independent standard has been already moving forward. So uh, I think for us, the uh, it's really uh, we have already the enabling environment where we can implement article 6 but uh, uh, just to uh, point to the opportunity and challenges uh, i also like to uh, just uh, maybe a broader perspective of opportunities uh, and uh, which is i think we have also seen the growing interest of the carbon market uh, i think uh, that is basically backed by the uh, the net zero target by many countries. Uh, actually, we are now shifting towards the how the carbon market will can be uh, contribute to the net zero target. I think that really changed our whole landscape, and that's why many governments, many private sector, uh, many non stakeholders are interested in carbon market. At the same time, uh, particularly uh, since last year, uh, uh, we are also talking about high integrity carbon market, which is how we can ensure the credit will be high quality in terms of supply, and also how those which are using towards net zero target in their own context can be used towards contribution of uh, their net zero target from different contexts, from government, private sectors, and so on. And also, as we have also seen from the COP28 outcome from GST, we also have a linkage with the enhancement of NDC. It's already in the Article 6.1 mentioned about the, how this Article 6 is contributed to the implementation and enhancement of the NDC. That is a task that Article 6 is tasked. So I think for us, it is really important to really looking at those net zero target, how the high integrity carbon market could be ensured, and how Article 6 contribute to the next cycle of NDC, or even more, and how it can be achieved towards net, uh, NDC achievement. So I think all of that would really basically increase the awareness and interest of the, uh, all the stakeholders to use this carbon market also in line with Article 6 context. So uh, that uh, would basically explains what uh, also Andrea and beyond talks about the uh, all the bilateral agreement taking place. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, many also countries are also moving ahead implementation. And also, I like to mention that in the even the 6.4, uh, we in the 6.4 supervisory body also adopted many decisions uh, last year, including 6.4 uh, activity standards, procedures, including CDM, transition standard procedures, accreditations for validation, verifications. So those, uh, I think we have already achieved to enable us to implementation. And also even the uh, voluntary market space where we have seen a lot of initiatives uh, and also uh, the kind of attempt to use independent standard as a way to achieve NDCs and also other mitigation purposes such as COSIA and even more. So I think uh, we see a lot of opportunities and the on the ground activities. I think those are the things that uh, uh, basically uh, in a broader context. But at the same time, I think uh, uh, from our, uh, uh, my point of view, <laughs> the challenges is also at the time at the uh, national level, uh, we have seen the uh, growing uh, uh, development of the policy, how to achieve NDC, and also the growing of the domestic carbon market, 
uh, depending on there. It could be ETS, it could be offset carbon credit market, or it could be the carbon tax. So there is a growing development of national level implementation. Uh, but at the same time, they need to think about how that will be linked to the Article 6 context, including international uh, market. And so they, uh, I think uh, uh, many countries are now still in the process of, okay, so how, how Article 6 can be incorporated in the NDC context, how they can be incorporated in the policy context in their own domestic. So I think those kind of national arrangements is still uh, uh, even in the early stage for many countries. Uh, some countries are advanced, some countries are not. I think those are the things that uh, uh, still uh, I see the challenges, but that's something we can think about how to or address that. And also in terms of the experience of the Article 6, uh, we have seen uh, some examples being, uh, such as initial report being submitted uh, by uh, some countries, uh, but also uh, we have, uh, we need to see more examples how, how those initial reports being uh, reviewed and completed. I think still those uh, process is still in the, in, in the process. And uh, we also need to uh, you know, raise more reviewers. Uh, and also, you know, after that, we have uh, also annual information. And this year is a transparency year, which uh, many countries are also expected to submit uh, the biannual transparency report under the Paris Agreement, where they're also looking for the, if you are engaging Article 6, the regular information together with uh, those uh, annual information to be submitted. And also uh, those infrastructure development is also going. Many uh, standard has its own registry and then how that could be uh, recording, uh, authorization, and then how that could be connected each other. I think those are the things that still we need to see how the, uh, the infrastructure will be developed. So I think those are things that uh, uh, in context of Article 6, we have uh, uh, challenges, uh, but those challenges will be addressed only through the implementation because we have already rules. So we need to implement and then see how those could be you know, applied in the context of Article 6 rules. And then others will also uh, share those experiences and then others could also follow and then it could be expanded. So I think for us, I think uh, it is really a time for implementation time to see the cases. And of course, we see the challenges for those areas which we have less experiences to, you know, how to align with the policy, how to align NDC. Those are things that we need to unpack. Uh, but the private sector will play a very important role to push those processes forward. Because in the end of the day, private sector is the one who are implementing those projects, implementing those activities, financing those things. That pushes those regulatory framework forward. So I think for us, uh, really engagement in the private sector is important, uh, but it could be tandem together with regulatory framework established, but same time together with private sector's involvement, financing, project development, and so on. So uh, I just wanted to yeah, uh, highlight those elements and uh, uh, maybe happy to uh, take part uh, later. Thank you. Yes, Kazu, thank you very much. So many of us know you used to be a negotiator now you are uh, implementation side. Welcome, you are participation to the market. But thank you very much. Uh, you pointed a lot of the barrier. Maybe the, at the second part, you have to reply to these questions, please. So the uh, next, uh, the Edwin, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be with such an extinguished, uh, distinguished panel group. Um, and just sort of like building on sort of like what's been said already in the presentations and the previous speaker is that obviously we are in an environment where things are moving relatively fast, uh, both in terms of uh, market developments, but also in lens, uh, policy landscapes. And even though uh, we all probably initially were very disappointed that at COP28 we were not able to uh, come to uh, agreement, uh, we could also turn it around and say, okay, it's a positive aspect, uh, because as already was mentioned, uh, there are already lots of experiences and um, concepts that have proven to work. But when you're looking at some of the issues that were still on the discussion, it's very much the details and the understandings of some of the new thinking, uh, how that works in practice. And 
Um, there, I think that certainly we can uh, look at the opportunities to really build on the existing frameworks and existing aspects and use this period in which we're still looking for further uh, details, the decision within the Article 6 uh, environment to demonstrate some of the uh, concerns that parties have raised, but also the market has raised around, for example, some of the lessons that we learned from the, the clean development mechanism. Uh, I saw in some of the questions that have already come through that people, for example, were looking at how um, the rights of indigenous peoples or how the environment and social governance would be controlled within the Article 6. And I think this is where really opportunity exists within the current market to really demonstrate um, with the, the new initiatives how particularly this front of the market uh, quality is actually embedded uh, through the voluntary market, but also through the various approaches that currently are taken by uh, different countries that collaborate on the Article 6.2. So for me, I think that, yes, we clearly uh, see that with the uh, non-adoption of new text on the 62, Article 6, we obviously have some delays in implementation, uh, but that's already been, been mentioned very much by previous speakers. There is no reason for us to really stop uh, and sit uh, and wait for this decision because we actually uh, have already uh, probably 95% of the rules and understandings in, in place that we can work with. We're really looking at some of the details and ultimately some choices that we would want to uh, see to further enhance the uh, scalability, but also in terms of providing the assurances that uh, increasingly the voluntary market, but also uh, governments are seeking to uh, establish that are not always directly linked with uh, the, the carbon credits as an emission reduction or removal, process, but also in terms of the surrounding governance and environmental impacts that these projects have or these activities have. So in that respect, I really think that the uh, pause at the negotiations can be also a great opportunity for the market to really uh, accelerate uh, examples that can help provide how uh, trust can be built into the market through the different mechanisms uh, that currently are uh, on the table and being tested. And some of these may not necessarily uh, get the results that we want, but certainly will also give us the uh, indication of what is really important in terms of providing uh, trust uh, uh, within uh, the governments, but also within the market. Yes, thank you, Edwin. And they, you, you are, uh, your business is a verifier? So they are, are so, currently... Uh, yes, we, we obviously, uh, many of you may know DNV as one of the leading verifiers within CDM. Uh, currently, we're also uh, entering into the volatile market again after a period that we've uh, uh, stepped out. Uh, but we certainly are verifying both within the the carbon market, but also in many of the domestic uh, emission training programs like Korea and, and Europe. At the, at the second part, the, uh, maybe there are no guidance on a 6.4, So, but uh, we may go or we should go. So in that case, uh, uh, please show your idea about the uh, how to overcome this situation, please. Thank you very much. So the uh, next, we'd like to invite Stephanie, please. Thank you for having me. And um, I might try and focus on a particular perspective around this issue. So uh, I was previously with Carbon Growth Partners, a, a dedicated investment manager um, focused on international carbon markets. And I'm joining Pollination really to bring the policy and the investment side um, together. And so I really want to focus on, I guess, the risks and opportunities as a consequence of COP28 for an investor audience, and particularly what does that mean for financing from the private sector for implementation of Article 6. And I think one of the things that is not unique to carbon markets, but that investors in the private sector are often looking for are a few things. 
clarity, so around the rules, the processes and the procedures, a level of consistency so that they know that those rules, processes and procedures have a lifespan, whether or not that is two or three years or 10 years, and what the transition might look like around those rules, um, what that might mean in terms of transition, pathways, leveraging existing frameworks. And ultimately, I think these two factors really come together in providing the confidence to the private sector to really participate in the market. Because when we're thinking about the carbon market in general and emissions trading, and particularly Article 6, we're really thinking about long-term decision-making, planning and implementation. You know, many projects that are being implemented will be implemented over, you know, a 10-year time horizon. And so that means there needs to be a level of trust and confidence in the systems and the policies and the processes, as well as where the market at that more macro level is going. And so I think one of the big things coming out of COP28 for the private sector is needing to think about how they engage with countries and policymakers differently. So in a scenario where many of the rules around 6.2 and 6.4 had been agreed, there is a kind of um, framework that is provided that really provides guidance to the private sector about how they might engage. What is different about the way that investors need to think about their engagement in the market in the absence of that agreement is to be thinking and engaging on a more direct basis with countries, because we will see, and as we know, there will continue to be implementation of Article 6, um, particularly more uh, bilateral agreements under 6.2. And also we'll see continued implementation of national and regional policy frameworks. And so that will mean that it, it in many ways, will mean there is, a, I guess, a, a bit of a, a proliferation of different frameworks that the private sector needs to engage in, but there's also benefits for them to do that. So I think a couple of the risks and opportunities without taking up too much of that time, I think there's an opportunity for those countries who really lean heavily into providing strong national policy frameworks and guidance. So those who already have those in place or are developing them, that's an opportunity for them to attract private sector partners in implementation of projects, particularly in this environment where it can be seen as a little bit complex. Um, I think that we're going to see uh, more pressure, and this is potentially a risk around whether or not the private sector looks to allocate money within the voluntary carbon market or Article 6. So how do those two markets come together over time? Um, and I think that there will be, and this is both a risk and an opportunity, there are always, you know, two, two sides of the same coin, more bilateral agreements that are developed. And I think the private sector needs to engage in those processes more comprehensively where they can, and also to look for opportunities for there to be compatibility between national and international frameworks thought about in the context of Article 6. Um, so there's there's more risks than opportunities, but just wanted to touch on a couple of those, and particularly from the finance and investor perspective, and we can talk about how we unlock those and, and scale those as part of the second question that you have for us. Thank you very much. Very interesting point. There are many market and many diverted market. That is a both and the opportunity and the risk. And maybe uh, we can choose uh, or, uh, any of the good market. Maybe that's a good information to the market player. Thank you very much. So the finally, other Florence, please. Yes, hello, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm the Global Senior Director on Climate Policy of Conservation International. Uh, for those who don't know, Conservation International is an international NGO with over 30 years of experience um, implementing projects to conserve and restore nature uh, in general worldwide. Uh, we do have also a finance branch, uh, including carbon finance uh, uh, departments, so investing in projects uh, in the voluntary carbon market. And we do have also a big science grounds and team. And finally, the government piece, so supporting governments developing uh, the enabling conditions and the enabling policy environment needed uh, to really be able to protect and conserve nature. So what I'm going to bring uh, to this panel is the nature-based uh, uh, perspective, nature-based credit perspective within Article 6, and specifically in terms of the opportunities and challenges after COP. So specifically... 
uh, under 6.2, the, the country-driven approach, uh, as has already been said, most has been already agreed. We have, uh, including for nature, the basis uh, to move forward. Uh, many of uh, the agreements that Ayeta showed before, including, for example, Singapore, which is, I think, one of the largest now uh, buyers of nature-based credits, um, signing MOUs, intention of buying nature-based credits and so on. Um, so we do have that happening uh, um, and this should continue to, to, to be able to move from this memorandum of understandings, government to government agreements to actual validation of programs and issues of first credits. We do need all the policy environment in place. And that has been said a bit is a challenge because it's a lot of pieces that need to be there. Uh, in terms of MRV, monitoring, registries, um, uh, safeguards, and so on, um, based on the Cancun safeguards, the Varsal framework for RED, so for nature that has already been agreed on. Um, so this needs time. Uh, additionally to that, um, as mentioned by Stephanie, I think the interaction of voluntary carbon market and this regulated market is crucial to give the certainty and the legal security that the market needs, because today the voluntary carbon market is the one that is has been really there for a long time. So we don't want to, to, to have a negative impact on that. Um, and as we know, it has already been agreed already that is up to the country to decide how it's going to treat the voluntary carbon market. So within this policies, we really need to see that also. It's important to give this signal to the market. Um, within Article 6.2, I think the challenge is but uh, has already been said, but I want to stress that is, um, and thinking about the private sector, how it can engage, we're seeing some three parties kind of agree agreement also, private sector, uh, uh, buyer and seller. And I think as, since we are in a nascent market, let's say under different rules, um, it's important that all the stakeholders sit together uh, to discuss also this policy development, as mentioned. Sometimes the government won't see something uh, that a project developer might have in mind in terms of risks or challenges or barriers to continue uh, developing and acting in this market. The same for the private sector, the investor, and so on. So it's important to get all the stakeholders together. Uh, after COP, I would say for 6-2, there's some risk still although most of it has been agreed on, um, there was a lot of discussion at this COP uh, around aligning, having a better alignment of 6.4 and 6.2, meaning potentially baselines, methodologies, some requirements of 6.4 that has not been yet agreed on uh, coming to 6.2. And we see that as a risk in terms of, well, if now it's happening, agreements are being uh, uh, assigned and programs are being developed and so on, depending on what is decided, it could yeah, just negatively impact if, for example, a program or country needs to adapt the whole methodology it has been using or make a big change in authorization or registry process and so on. So this is something to keep an eye on, I would say. Uh, and also, even a small, all this authorization process and so on, we've seen regulation that many countries, because things have not uh, been agreed on, they are kind of leaving a little bit, just setting the general principles uh, and letting for later uh, uh, the kind of uh, establishment of, of this specification. So um, these are the small risks I would, I would see after COP. And 6.4, for nature, um, there's a big discussion around if nature-based, so removals, nature-based removals should be at all in 6.4. Uh, so there's a whole ideological, I would say, a big discussion and divergence among parties, whether kind of the tech removals versus, I would say, the nature-based removals, arguments around um, nature-based not being permanent as technological ones and so on. And so there's a big risk that basically uh, nature-based removals, meaning afforestation and reforestation projects are not allowed to be uh, on the 6.4. Um, this will be for us a setback. Uh, as we know, CDM had uh, afforestation, reforestation, uh, methodology already developed and so on. So for nature, that would be potentially negative. Um, um, and yeah, actually a lot is yet to be done, I would say in 6.4. So for us, uh, it was very frustrating to see 
for example, the methodology, at least the methodologies uh, document and guideline being a it should have been, it could have been approved, uh, and that would have allowed at least for methodologies to start being submitted and evaluated, and things kind of uh, making some progress to get uh, this UN centralized market totally um, operational, I would say. So um, I would say there are some challenges still, uh, as I mentioned, but uh, a lot still can be done, and anyways, until we really talking about nature-based credits, until we see the first issuance of credits, uh, there'll be still some time. Uh, so uh, eventually at COP, next COP, uh, the remaining issues will be agreed on and will make just things easier and give all the certainty that the market and the governments need. Um, and of course, just to have in mind also that um, it's important that we have the highest integrity possible also under 6.2. Uh, 6.2, as it is, has been designed, has the basic rules, but has, for example, the prerogative of the countries, for example, choosing methodologies and some more specific criteria. Uh, so um, it has the opportunity to set uh, kind of the, give the example also to the, uh, to, to the SB and 6.4 uh, regulations, uh, but we need to be sure uh, that these are high integrity so we don't start a new market, let's say, already uh, being put under criticism, uh, which is something definitely that we, I think we have enough today of that and we need to, to kind of really push for, for high integrity. Uh, so this would be my, my initial remarks on that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, the point is, uh, I think there are 6.2 and 6.4, a uh, different situation and a different risk. And but today maybe uh, later Kazu will uh, make a comment about the Rule for 6.2. Kazu already mentioned that the rule is there. Maybe, and uh, Kazu will reply and make a comment to some extent. So, the, uh, we would like to move on to the uh, second part that is important one how to overcome and uh, how to scale up the uh, Article 6 market. Uh, before discussing about it, and uh, uh, Yamamoto san, could you uh, show the slide, please? Yes, thank you very much. I uh, This is a, a kind of opinion poll by uh, Japanese companies. The how to scale up the JCM, it's uh, Article 6.2. So the surprise perspective and the bias perspective are there. So the one interesting is uh, both supplier and buyer uh, want to have a continuity of the JCM, because supplier want to uh, expect it, JCM will be extended after 2030. And also buyers, they would like to uh, expect uh, JCM credit will be eligible for uh, GX ETS even after 2030. So under the Paris Agreement, we are discussing about and the negotiator and negotiate about the rule for 2030, but the market player and the market user would like to have a much longer period of framework. I think that is an important message. And the, also the uh, rule for credit to sharing, and uh, because of the Article 6, the uh, credit will be issued both host country and the investment countries registry how to share this credit. Uh, that rule should be uh, clear. So such kind of the expectation are there. This is a, just an example of the uh, uh, thing, to, thing to do uh, for scaling up uh, the uh, Article 6, particularly in this case, uh, JSM. Thank you. So there, uh, we would like to uh, move on to the discussion. Please. Yes, thank you. So the uh, next one is, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, yeah, how to scale up. What is the idea and how uh, overcome the barrier? Already we pointed out the barrier and the risk. So regarding th this point, and uh, uh, I would like to invite the panelists, but to reverse order. So uh, uh, first Florence and Stephanie, Edwin, and Kaz, this order, please. So first Florence, please. 
Yeah, thank you. So to scale up, I mean, as I mentioned, regulation is key and we need all this regulation, all this clarity and these enabling conditions out there. Uh, there's a lot of capacity building needed in many, um, for many stakeholders, not only governments, buyers or sellers, but also private sector, communities, local NGOs, and so on. So there's a, there's a big universe ecosystem of stakeholders that need to be informed. Um, um, so these are the two, I would say, and more collaboration, as mentioned, mm -hmm. to including policy development, because uh, hearing these different perspectives to be able to develop um, a national context, a national mar national markets and international market that really is effective and realistically and realistic, basically, mm -hmm. uh, it's important. So we have a lot of experience already in carbon markets, including in nature with the VCM, with CDM a little bit too. So uh, we, we cannot throw that uh, in the bin, I would say, which uh, I think with some criticism, with the criticisms we had a little bit in the past years in the market, uh, some some attempt to do that, and I think it'd just be a waste of time uh, because there's a lot of lessons learned that, there. We need to learn from that, improve. Um, and one thing I think it's important to have in mind, not only in the national context, but also within UNFCCC and the Article 6 discussions, is that we need a balance between regulation uh, and action, I would say. And this means, in other words, that we cannot overcomplicate things and be, uh, make a market that is over bureaucratic. And some pieces of Article 6 4 uh, look like going to that direction. It's become even more complex in terms of procedures and steps than uh, CDM was. And CDM was already like very complex. Um, so, uh, and of course, with that come costs. We don't, the, the market yet is not, at least for nature, the price is not there yet where it should be uh, to really uh, be a, a, um, a living market. And, and uh, so we need to be careful also of that. Um, so this would be my my point in terms of scaling up. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, uh, the, the, uh, the already uh, and the behind the schedule. So that we'd like to reduce a comment. And also the, we, I, see, I saw the many uh, questions are already there. So the, uh, Stephanie, please, uh, please uh, take care of the time constraint, please. I will try to be very brief. Um, firstly, I agree with and would say I think Florence has really, um, I think, hit the nail on the head with some of the things that we really need to see in the market, both from a kind of ideological perspective, that idea of not becoming overly bureaucratic and focusing on action, not just on procedures and processes, um, but also that they are necessary um, to be there. I would say I think there are a couple of things that I see is crucially important. Leveraging the existing markets, I think there is a strong tendency within the detail around particularly 6.4 and procedural matters to really want to kind of reinvent the wheel. Um, the market that we have at the moment or the markets that we have at the moment have already built on the lessons that have been learnt from the CDM. The VCM methodologies, for example, many have come out of the CDM that have then been further refined, have greater scrutiny, and that goes through an evolution process. We've also seen that in national frameworks. And so I think there's an opportunity, um, you know, including leveraging the JCM and some of the other sharing. So if we want to see greater participation in the market, how do we make it easier for people who may be reluctant or see the market as being overly complex? So particularly those who are not direct participants in the market, who aren't project developers, who aren't NGOs, who aren't countries working in that, how do we make that information more readily available? And I think that's obviously something that um, the Article 6 Implementation Partnership has had a strong focus on. Particularly, I think, how does this work and how, in particular countries? And what do those rules look like, particularly the intersection between the voluntary market, um, any national compliance market that they ha may have in place and how they engage in the international market? And then I would say focusing on action. So what can we do to get tripartite agreements together to have countries in the private sector putting in place pilots and then sharing the information about that and demonstration around that and the lessons learnt so that others can then follow and we can see those scale up. So I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Yeah, thank you very much. So the um, the, the both of you said that, that don't be too, too complicated. Action is important. 
of course. Thank you very much. So next, uh, the uh, Edwin, please. Uh, th thanks. And again, I, I fully endorse what Florence and uh, Stephanie said. So uh, I, in that respect, I can be very short uh, in that uh, aspect. Uh, I, I also want to just sort of like reiterate that, yes, uh, rules are important, um, but the complexity is certainly something that is, is a big concern, particularly when we talk about 6.4. And um, um, we certainly seen some leveraging happening from uh, the previous markets and existing markets, but we also have seen um, sometimes a fallback to we know this and therefore we copy that and particularly when some of the the aspects around the cdm and, and uh, i fully in, uh, endorse what florence says that article 64 was supposed to be an, 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 an a simpler version of the cdm or more streamlined version of the cdm and seemed to go the other direction uh, in, in many ways so uh, at the same time we also have to recognize that um the market and the needs uh, have significantly changed, particularly when we're looking at the, the, the Kyoto to the Paris Agreement, uh, where the focus is not so much on uh, transition, but really on the atmospheric uh, concentrations uh, and, and the impacts that this has. And I think that's something that uh, clearly needs to be reflected. Uh, and certainly I would uh, see a, a big role of um the market to see how we translate the core cover principles in clear concise rules uh, as well as simplistic systems that the market can adopt uh and, and finally I, I also what stephanie says i think it's important that um we find ways to adopt the the global process into understandable domestic uh actions and, and processes so that people that have to implement this actually know how they operate locally they don't necessarily have to know how it all works in the global sense so i think that's uh, my point in terms of yes thank you so connecting with domestic policy yeah actually for implementation that is what i'm saying thank you so the fine narrow one is Kazu. <laughs> Thank you very much. You pointed a lot of the barriers. So the maybe not enough time to respond to the old barriers. Uh, so uh, but the, please uh, take some of your thought how to overcome the barriers, please. And uh, I would like to ask the secretary of A6IP, uh, please check the Q and A box, please, and uh, uh, prepare for. Uh, which pro uh, question would be uh, picked up for the next session? Please uh, prepare for it. So uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, again, uh, Taz, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hobo-san. And uh, maybe already many things have been uh, mentioned. Uh, I also prepared some uh, three points, uh, but those are more or less covered. But at the same time, I also wanted to uh, provide, uh, we need to think about solution. We need to think about how to make it to, towards action, which is all needed. Uh, in that sense, I uh, also wanted to mention that we really need to start with some specific project, some demonstration, some pilot, uh, whatever that is called. I think that we start with some specific or uh, the project to start with. Uh, I think that's really important to really bring all the rules moving forward. Uh, maybe Edwin, you remember that the first time when the CDM project was started, Everybody is okay. So this is the kind of thing that we can do. And then that could be proliferated. And then that is a some kind of examples, really showing some example piloting, and that can be replicated and that can be showed. I think uh, we really need to, this year is particularly, uh, we really need to show those examples that others could follow. Uh, and the next point, uh, especially uh, with regard to the Article 6 implementation is uh, particularly on the 6.2 context, I think we really need to develop more initial report, more, you know, those things are first kind of step for the Article 6 engagement in the context of the international area, where we can also see some example, we can also see how it will be in you know, organized authorization, how it could be organized their implementation and activities, including those, uh, I think, uh, um, the, I think, uh, Florence, you mentioned about methodologies and 
how the you know, integrity in the 6.2 to be ensured and so on. So I think uh, initial report is a really important uh, step. Uh, I think that's also provide more example to uh, to others. So um, yeah, in this context, I think uh, important to have more initial report and also mention about the uh, 6.4 context. Uh, of course, it was uh, uh, for me. I think also unfortunate, uh, you know, that the methodology, including the removals, was not adapted. But at the same time, uh, already uh, we have a draft recommendation, which also specify more specific tools will be developed, including baseline additionality, leakage tool, and also removals. We need to also see how the risk assessment tool will be developed. So all in all, needs to be kind of put together to come into uh, into the uh specific operationalization uh and i i think we could still think about what kind of potential activity we propose in a 6.4 context uh and then we can propose those projects or think about project following the discussion in 6.4 supervisory body and then that also is quite important to push uh, that process forward uh, and also we have a cdm transition uh that has been also proposed uh we we see more than 1300 projects being proposed and then that could actually trigger how those projects being approved by the domestic context and then that also be linked to the initial report preparation accounting issues and authorization so i think 62 and 64 is not separate 64 is also under the umbrella of 62 accounting which we already have all the rules so i think we also think about Maybe in the 6.4 context, there are already seeding project activities, specific project in the country, which they already requested transition, which also trigger the start of 6.0 and then also link to the 6.2 context. Uh, even the voluntary market, also independent standard, I think would be also uh, important to encourage those independent standards could be authorized uh, and then also submitted in their report. So I think those kind of examples really kind of, uh, you know, um, strengthen the more confidence and then how that could be worked. I think we need to see actual example. We need to see how those could be authorized. And so I think those are uh, the area where we can focus this year. And also, I well, lastly, uh, point out the information uh, sharing. Uh, I think that was also mentioned by uh, Florence and also mentioned by the more clarity uh, in terms of domestic content, on the confidence in the investment. I think in order to have a credit, in order to have a confidence, more information, and I see that proliferation of the different market and domestic context and different arrangements, I think more information kind of stored in the one place or having more kind of a, a transparency around this carbon market, I think that also provides more confidence. So uh, we hope that uh, uh, Article 6 Implement Partnership can also provide such kind of information to be more connected, more available for the private sector the investors, uh, also the government. And uh, we have we may also have a different authorization, different authorization processes in different countries where the contact and then how to kind of communicate with the government between private sector and, and government in each country context. Those are things that we see more capacity building, awareness raising, and the more kind of information sharing could benefit. So we hope that we can provide those solutions. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the backbone of that is a capacity building for all the stakeholders to understand how Article 6 works and then how 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 we can involve all this. So just want to stop here, but uh, I think oh, yeah. all of it is already, we are in the picture of how we can kind of implement and hopefully that put into the practice. Yeah, thank you very much, Kaz. And I think it's uh, Florence, are you ready? Yeah, thank you very much for joining. Yes, sorry, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. And I keep in touch. Thank you. So, there, uh, we would like to move on to the question and the answer session. And the, I think the, uh, we have uh, six minutes for QA. So, the Nakamura san, can you uh, pick up some question and uh, leave the question, please? Yes. The, uh, and also, the... maybe I can share my last section okay. to use for the QA because okay. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. About already way so, we, we can borrow five minutes from you. Thank you. All right. So, the, the uh, most like uh, is for what are the practical ways for the private sector to engage and share feedback? on the private sector consideration for the G2G bilateral rulemaking and procedures. Corporate sector could be happy to share the aspects to make 
the Article 6 operational, operationalized from the environmental and financial perspectives, ideally before the bilateral rules are finalized. So I'm amenable to further consideration. So that's a uh, uh, comment that and uh, comments in the question, which uh, uh, gathered a lot of likes. Maybe I think the answer is this platform. <laughs> and the, uh, the uh, I think the Andrea is here. Can you make any comment? Hi, hi, Ongosan. Yes. Uh... Well, I think it's dialogue uh, between governments and the private sector. Uh, this platform is a very good example. Uh, I invite governments to be open to uh, feedback from the private sector. Uh, as uh, the person asking the question said, uh, getting feedback as early as possible uh, and see this. Um, so the, I'm afraid my connection. Yeah. I'm afraid my connection dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I'm not sure where you stopped hearing me. But I, I think the dialogue needs to start uh, as early as possible, and and be open. And uh, governments should see this as a partnership uh, with the private sector to deliver uh, emission reductions and removals. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. So the uh, Nakamura-san, next question, please read it. Yes, next question is, could you elaborate more in the explanation with the voluntary carbon market, business-to-business -business approach? Thank you. We will respond to this question. Uh, maybe I can just start, yes. uh, make a start off on that one. I, I think that... Uh, uh, obviously, we already see the um, different initiatives that we, uh, within the voluntary market, with the ICVCM and VCMI, uh, that uh, bring more action between business and business. But at the same time, I think it's also in, uh, um, important to realize that there are also other programs that are more business to business related, whereby we're looking at uh, a reporting uh, of uh, emissions between uh, and trans sharing uh, in emission data between businesses. And I think that's also an area where there is a lot of um, building of trust happening that can help ultimately the voltage car market in terms of designing and identifying where uh, action needs to be taken in terms of uh, the low-hanging fruit for emission reductions as well as sharing and providing uh, quality data that people can rely upon uh, and provide confidence within the market. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, you commented on uh, um, many diverted market are here. So do you have any comment? Yeah, and I think there are a couple of questions in the chat, which I might try and cover off as well, which are about the intersection between mm -hmm. the VCM and Article 6 and around corresponding adjustments. So I think, you know, we're seeing increasing interest, I think, in the VCM as providing the infrastructure for the international carbon market, not just about voluntary um, emissions commitments and net zero commitments and businesses meeting those, but providing the infrastructure that's needed for an international market to operate um, where there is not the existing infrastructure. So many countries do not have the registry infrastructure or methodologies or you know verification systems in place and we do have that within the voluntary carbon market it's also a system that many businesses despite lots of scrutiny that's come to the market over the last you know 12 to 18 months do understand they understand how the vcm operates they understand how the registries operate they understand those processes so i think there is a lot that can be leveraged from that um, for businesses to think about how they participate in Article 6 markets. And increasingly, we're actually seeing in 6.2 the use of the VCM infrastructure with additional requirements to be used as a way for credits to be issued and then used um, 
and transferred under bilateral agreements. And I think we will see more of that in the absence of having other infrastructure and procedural matters having been agreed um, you know, in COP28. So while we're waiting for that to happen, I think we'll see more of the VCM plus. So VCM plus additional requirements for Article 6 coming online. So just trying to address some of those other questions that we have there um, in the interest of time. Thank you very much. And I understand the project is a project, but the actual project is a reduction. Thank you. So Nakamura-san, next question, please. Yes. Uh, next question is, what specific measures are taken by AYETA and its members to ensure that ind Indigenous peoples and local communities are included throughout the whole project implementation process to avoid the IPLCs from utilizing the SP's appeals and grievances and mechanisms? which may be costly for both IPLCs and businesses. Andrea, please. Yes, happy to take that. Uh, so our views on uh, the involvement of indigenous peoples and local communities uh, were outlined in a consultation, in a submission to the uh, 6.4 supervisory body at the end of last year. Uh, we do support extensive uh, consultation because as uh, not, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because uh, it, there's a business interest. A project uh, cannot go ahead smoothly if the local communities are not uh, involved and are not uh, on board uh, with the project. Uh, in terms of uh, specific measures, uh, I think uh, Stephanie or other panelists are perhaps more uh, hands-on on that and can can comment on, on specific measures. Um, but um, well, I think it, it, it is a crucial aspect and it's increasingly uh, recognized by all, all carbon market stakeholders. Yes, thank just, you very much. Yeah, so many, please. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's one of the areas where the additional scrutiny, the transparency and information that's uh, available now in the market that wasn't available five to 10 years ago really starts to particularly when it comes to the use of a, a, an emissions reduction unit, whether regardless of where that has been issued from, I think one of the things that we're seeing is a greater expectation about ensuring that Indigenous people and local communities have been consulted, are included, that there is genuine benefit sharing in place. A lot more of that, there is greater expectations around transparency, particularly around benefit sharing ongoing engagement with those communities. So we're seeing that from, a, I guess, a buyer and an end user perspective as well, that they're looking for that when they may invest in a project. Um, if a, a buyer or private sector partner is looking to retire a credit, that they really need to make sure that that project can demonstrate that have, has been done well. Um, so I think that's one of the areas where the scrutiny that we're seeing coming into the market alongside some of the procedural matters will really start to help um, and um, I guess really lift the bar on what's happening there as well. Uh, Edwin, and uh, from Verifier point of views, can I have your comment? Yeah, the, the, clearly the, the, this has been something that has been on the table for uh, uh, many years. And as Stephanie said, we certainly see that there's increasing demand uh, and awareness of it. Um, the and, and that's sort of like also uh, linked to one of the other questions that was around okay uh, the supply and demand uh, quality differences. Um, certainly, everybody is recognizing the need to have uh, local communities and equal distribution or attributable distribution in, included in the process. I think from Verify point of view, we often run into the uh, challenges of interpreting uh, domestic uh, rules against um, bias expectations that are not always uh, the same, whereby um, rules that may be uh, logical and acceptable within the buyer's environment may not always be directly applicable within the domestic uh, or, or the project development site uh, purely because of uh, cultural differences and if, uh, cultural expectation or uh, the manner in which people will express or demonstrate these kind of uh, issues 
to uh, to invalidate or uh, as such. So it is certainly an area. And again, this comes back to my early comments around why we may actually be uh, lucky or be uh, happy about the fact that we may not have locked in uh, all the rules uh, as such is because this is actually where I think there's a lot of scope for the voluntary markets to uh, come up with tools and provide examples of how uh, right approaches have actually delivered uh, confidently the proof to not only the verifiers but also to the, the buyers uh, that the uh, local rights and interests were properly adopted as well as more importantly responded to over time because we certainly have seen uh, from, the, from the CDM that uh, there was a high emphasis on uh, sustainability at the early stage of the project, but there was a lack of continuation of that process uh, uh, since it was not part of the VVB's uh, curfew to actually uh, assess whether continuous in, uh, interaction with local communities was maintained and complaints from local communities was addressed in, in within the project. So I think that's uh, certainly an area where the voluntary market can really demonstrate uh, good practices and uh, acceptable uh, approaches that could be then built into potentially future requirements of the uh, Article 6. Yeah, thank you very much. So the last question, uh, that this is a very important and a serious question for, and also not easy to implement. It, it is important, but anyhow. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, this. Uh, we should uh, fi uh, finish the panel and uh, panel session here. And uh, I would uh, thank you very much for our panelists. And uh, also, I would like to uh, uh, back to the uh, uh, Nakamura san. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hongo san, and the panelists uh, for uh, various uh, discussion. And uh, very sorry that uh, the, uh, all the question was not absorbed uh, due to the time constraint. However, the question provided this time can be recorded at the center for the further consideration of the program in the future so that your question is not in vain. So the thank you all the uh, people who uh, make a question here. Now, it is about to conclude the session, but before having the closing, uh, I would like to ask you, for your kind cooperation uh, for the feedback form, which is popped out on your screen, so that your comments, we can, uh, we can uh, plan future activities together with the private sector. So that I'm grateful that if you can fill in there and all the uh, uh, answer can be recorded for the further consideration. And uh, uh, writing, uh, by writing this form and uh, Although uh, we try to limit the time for absorb the question, but I would be grateful that if you can, if uh, our director, Kazu uh, Kwaku, uh, uh, to make a, a brief closing remark so that uh, it's, I mean, you can, uh, I, all the audience can have a time to fill the form in. So uh, um, I would like to pass the floor to director uh, Kazu, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nakamura-san, and thank you for all the uh, participants today. And uh, we really appreciate if you could uh, uh, feedback to us so that we can also uh, capture our future activities and also reflect uh, into our uh, our activities in the Article 6 Implementer Partnership. Um, and also, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, we are also planning to, together with AIDA, uh, and also many private uh, uh, sectors uh, to uh, look for more activities in, in the context of Article 6 implementation. Um, and uh, I think uh, like a government uh, private sector platform uh, could be something also useful where we are also providing support for the government for the development of Article 6 implementation. 
and also many opportunities could exist for the private sector engagement uh, in terms of uh, uh, what is the business opportunities could exist utilizing bilateral or independent standard or even 6.4 uh, and then understanding all the rules and uh, uh, methodologies. Um, I think we are also planning uh, such kind of event uh, to engage more private sector, uh, also in the context of the uh, host countries engagement. So uh, we are very much looking forward to um, you know continue our work and uh, uh, also uh, really uh, like to uh, thank all the uh, great panelists uh, as well as the moderator Hongo San for your uh, great. Uh, uh, moderations uh, and also presentation uh, by the AIDA uh, and also our uh, great collaboration together. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, close this uh, workshop and also uh, please uh, provide your feedback and uh, we very much value your feedback. And thank you very much for today. Thank you very much. With this, I would like to conclude today's webinar. Uh, grateful if you kindly uh, stay connected with A6IP, IGS, and Ayeta, and I'm looking forward to see you uh, for the next opportunity. Have the good rest of your day. Bye-bye.